Thank you. Uh, so let me just start by reminding um, what the theorem is. So it's going to be important for later too, so maybe I'll try to even keep it. So just to recap from last time, here's our theorem that we're trying to prove. I think I called the theorem one. So we have an atoroidal closed symplectic manifold. Um, an isolated um, a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with an isolated <coughs> periodic orbit x, one periodic orbit. Um, we have assumed that the homology class of the orbit is non-zero in H1 mode torsion, H1 uh, integer homology class. And that uh, I also had two other assumptions. Uh, well, this is one of them. So this was, um, no, I think, how did I write this? I think the fact that it was essential, this is here. So let me write it here. This was one, I think. And two is that the number of um, periodic orbits, one periodic orbits in its uh, homology class is finite. And then there was a moreover part, uh, which is that if it happens that uh, uh, pi one is hyperbolic and torsion free uh, then um, there's an if here i and 2 i can be uh, replaced by the assumption that the homotopy class is not trivial basically okay so this is the notation I was using for pre homotopy classes. Okay. So this is the theorem that we are trying to prove. Um, there is no assertion as far as I can see. Uh, I didn't write the assertion of the theorem. Um, so let's edit here. The assertion is that for every sufficiently large prime P, um, phi has a simple uh, periodic orbit and this will be in class zeta to the p where I believe zeta was my notation for the homotopy class of our uh, beginning orbit and it's got period either uh, P or P prime. Uh, this is the first prime which comes after P. Okay? And then there comes the moreover assumption, moreover part here. Okay, so we got this started. Uh, we did the first step. And in the first step, uh, was exactly what uh, one of the things uh, Victor talked about today, and that was the persistence of local polar homology. I said that there was, you know, there are several ingredients in this proof, and one of them is this. And we okay, and this is under admissible iteration. So, um, uh, as I said, for us, uh, we will be working with large primes, which will be uh, admissible. And the fact that this is non-zero implies that this is non-zero. So there is a shift, of course. So this is true up to a shift of degree. Um, P x to the P is non-zero. And uh, there was one more thing that was the 
discussed in the first lecture today, which is that local fluor homology spaces are building blocks for uh, fluor homology groups. And so, uh, for example, in a closed manifold, if you take a um, if you take a, a, an action value um, and um, um, if you assume that the periodic one periodic orbits with that action value are isolated, then you can actually write the following thing. So let's say uh, C M is C is uh, a real number, and that all X i in P one H um, with action C are isolated. Uh, then um, if you give me a small enough epsilon, um, then I will have the following uh, thing. So I will have the filtered homology uh, in this interval around the section value. And I can write this as In particular, uh, what this tells me is that uh, there should be some homotonians here. Uh, right, exactly. This is how I want to think about it. Now, in particular, um, in our case, of course, I will be looking at filtered polar homology. So I will be looking at uh, there will be an interval with endpoints outside the action uh, spectrum. So we'll be looking at this. So I can write this uh, just like that. Here x is the periodic orbit from the pair up. And I will be a small interval centered at the action of x, basically. And knowing that this is not 0 will tell us that this is not 0. So just a tiny addition to what we discussed last time. Um, OK, so now let's move on to the second part, uh, second ingredient here. So let's look at uh, the consequences of uh, the assumptions that I have a um, non-zero non homology class and that I have uh, high, finitely many periodic orbits in that class. So in other words, consequences of i and 2i. Uh, further consequences. Okay, so um, uh, the fact that I have um, uh, this finiteness, so P H um, X finite, uh, implies the following thing. So again, sticking to the notation, let me just use uh, this here. Uh, which is, of course, the same as this. So it tells us the following things. Um, this is the homology class corresponding to the homotopy class of our orbit. So there will be, if this is finite, uh, that means that there will be only finitely many homotopy classes. Uh, let's write it this way. I free homotopy classes uh, occurring as the uh, free homotopy classes of orbits, one periodic orbits of H um, in here. Now, zeta, which is the class of our orbit, is just one of them. But because this altogether this number is finite, I can only have finitely many uh, homotopy classes here, basically. Again, zeta is one of the zeta i's, basically. This is what's going on. 
Um, what does this buy us? This buys us uh, that actually when you look at large prime powers of these classes, they're all distinct. Um, for all prime p. So why is this the case? This is important. This is a very important part of the proof, actually, uh, that I can basically say that these classes are distinct. Um, so let's, let's look into this. Uh, the proof is uh, not, not difficult in this case. It's simply, um, so here's what's true. If you give me any group, Uh, and elements uh, G and H, let's say they, they are different and that they are uh, different than identity in the group. Uh, then if you look at uh, prime powers of them, okay, so this can happen uh, for at most one prime. This is uh, easy to prove. You just uh, assume not, then you will have two primes. Write their linear combination as uh, for some integers a and b, if there are two primes like this. And then uh, start taking the powers g is equal to g to do this, and replace everything by h. And then what you will get is that if there are two, you have g and h equal to each other. So it is just a simple uh, general group theory thing. Uh, so now the same holds for actually conjugacy classes. Uh, and, and then they are done because uh, all we need to do is, because we have only finitely many elements here, all we need to do is just take a large, uh, take large primes, basically, so that this, is, this kind of thing happens. So this means that these are going to be distinct. Okay, so just to conclude. The same holds for conjugate classes. Okay, so any finite collection of distinct conjugacy classes um, will have um, their large enough prime powers uh, distinct from each other. So now at this point, let me assume from now on all our primes uh, satisfy uh, are large so that both one and two hold. There will be actually further uh, restrictions on them, but uh, so just assume that this this happens, um, and that the admissibility condition is we talked last time. So now the idea of the proof uh, is the following. Actually, this is the <laughs> how the proof works, uh, not just the idea of the proof. Uh, so let's take a. Again, large prime um, power, so sufficiently large uh, prime, so that um, there is no simple, there are no uh, simple t periodic orbits of H in to the p homotopy class. If there is no such prime power, we're done. Basically, we proved our statement. So now let's take p. Uh, if not, there is such a prime power. So let's pick something, uh, work with primes like that. And we want to show that if this is the case, we want to show that uh, then there has to be uh, a simple p prime periodic orbit. Again, in this class, 
then this will prove r pair. P prime is this prime. It's the first one that is bigger than uh, the prime that we started with. Okay, so this is the strategy of the proof. Uh, so now let's just. So in particular, at this point, I'm assuming that there are no simple p periodic orbits uh, of H. So all of them. The first thing I'm going to say is that all of them are iterated, because p is a prime. Uh, so there is no simple p periodic orbit uh, in zeta to the p. This is a prime consequence. Sorry. Um, all um, p periodic orbits in this homotopic class are p iterated one periodic orbits. Okay, not just that. Uh, there is a moreover part. Uh, moreover, we can also say which homotopy class these one periodic orbits underlying ones belong to, and this is where this uh, comes into the picture. Um, zeta p, p is distinct. Okay, implies that. Uh, all these underlying one periodic orbits actually uh, come from um, uh, zeta, which is the homotopy class of our orbit, right? That's n nobody else is going to have a uh, power, which is zeta to the p, which is where we are working with, basically. All right, so out of this, we get the following uh, key equality, one side of which is always true, uh, the other side is the non-trivial part, is that if I look at the action spectrum for this h to the p, by the way, I can't remember whether it was Victor Stokes or not, but h to the p, again, this is the Hamiltonian sum if you have two, I think I didn't write it, two time dependent Hamiltonian, so this will be uh, HP plus, uh, it's like that, right? Uh, so this, this is, I'm just using this for short, basically. If you have autonomous, it's literally the sum, basically. Um, all right, so the action spectrum corresponds to, to this uh, iterated Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, these are the action values for one periodic, p, uh, one periodic orbits of H to the P or P periodic orbits of H in this class. So this is equal to P times the spectrum uh, uh, corresponding to H with orbits in class zeta. Okay, as I said, um, uh, this side of this uh, containment is always the case. Of course, you, you have the, uh, the covers of the orbits uh, one periodic, but the fact that this is correct, you need to show that there is nothing else contributing here. And this is exactly what uh, we did here, with these two statements. Okay, so this is the key step in this proof. Um, uh, so maybe... I should say that later on we will look at the case where uh, we won't assume a toroidal symplectic form. And then, in other words, when you allow recappings, anytime when you allow recappings, uh, you basically, uh, it messes up everything here. You, you no longer know that such a thing, uh, such a quality is the case. Basically, this is a major uh, difficulty, basically, when you have recappings. 
Okay, so by the way, these are all also calculated. Uh, last time I mentioned it. Um, everything is done with respect to our, you know, reference curves. Uh, when we put uh, reference curves here, z, then this will be the curves uh, given by iterations of the reference curve. Everything is done in coherence. Okay, so maybe it's a good moment also to remind us that this is a zero major set. Um, Close zero major set. All right, so now next step. Next step, we're going to be looking at, so maybe I can erase this. Make it C. Uh, I will want to look at, again, uh, continuation maps, homotopy from uh, the Hamiltonian. Uh, P iterated one, let's call it this way, and uh, P prime iterated one. Again, conveniently, Victor discussed extensively continuation maps uh, today. So I'm not going to, I'm basically going to use them. So looking at, we'll be looking at uh, homotopy. Uh, let's let's say homotopy. Uh, between H to P and H to the system. This is a, one of the you know, very standard ideas um, in, in flow theory in this kind of groups. Um, so what do I have in the picture? I will have a family H of S, uh, again, starting with H to the P ending at H to the P prime. And then I will actually go backward, basically. Um, and as Victor explained, um, uh, this will, uh, first of all, when you look at homotopy like that, uh, it's going to induce uh, the continuation maps, or it's going to induce a homomorphism in filtered polar homology. Uh, this, these maps is, are independent of homotopy, um, as long as you sort of your action intervals are compatible with the growth of your Hamiltonian throughout the process. Again, as Victor explained today. So this shift is going to be of the order of, um, in our case, I will write this, uh, the difference of the primes times the Hoffer norm of H, basically. Uh, so now, because the homotopy is independent, sorry, the maps are independent of homotopy, I will actually look at a specific one, a linear homotopy, so, and it will give me exactly what the shift is. So let's look at uh, a linear homotopy. So it's a map HS, so let me put HS here. Uh, so one minus FS, H to the P, plus FS, in one direction. Uh, F here is function like that, so it's something here. It will be equal to one here, here it will be equal to zero. Okay. And in this case, the shift is going to be the following. Uh, the shift of uh, action intervals, let's say. Um, is given by, um, I'll write this as C equals to E times P prime minus P, where E is the, essentially the whole fair norm. I'll write it this way just because um, depending on the functions of positive or negative. This is basically the whole fair norm. Okay, so, and then I have this P prime minus P here. Uh, now, this is of course something big O of the difference. Okay, and uh, more important uh, for us, here is something from number theory. Number theory tells us that the difference between two consecutive primes, the growth of this, is negligible compared to the growth of prime numbers. So this is small o of p. Again, this is going to be also very important uh, 
for adjusting our interval. So this is basically going to tell us that this shift is um, relatively small. So, uh, so then what uh, we are going to have? So let's uh, let's keep this. Maybe this is the part that we can erase. Okay, so there's our shift. Um, so one more thing no worth noticing or noting once more again that when you do this, uh, we are doing this continuation or homotopy between uh, orbits in the same homotopy class, and these maps preserve the homotopy class. This is basically cylinders, right, between uh, orbits in the same class. Okay. Um, so let me now before uh, we start getting even more specialized here, let me make one uh, simplifying, notational simplification, in other words. Assumption here, and just uh, let's, without loss of generality, suppose that uh, the action at our um, orbit x is equal to zero. Again, you can always add a constant to your Hamiltonian, which doesn't affect dynamics, of course, and uh, do achieve this. Okay, so this is just notational convenience. Um, and this, of course, implies that when I look at anything uh, iterated, this is homogeneous, right? So this is also zero. So let's just keep this in mind for any iteration k. So now I want to pick a small interval. I. Um, let's make it minus a a. Such that the action spectrum, remember that this is a zero major zero major set, uh, intersects with this interval only at one action value, and this is zero. I can isolate this uh, zero physically. And this is also equal to, by a, in our setting, of course, uh, if I look at the spectrum for this, which is just p times this spectrum, and if I intersect this p times the interval, by which I mean uh, this is just p minus p a p a. Okay. Uh, so. Um, so I have. So let's. I'm not done. I will have one more thing here. Um, Now let's write it. And I also want the following thing to be true. I want uh, pi plus 2c. Again, remember, c is uh, much small compared to grow to p. Here, uh, this will be, this is just a notation. This means I add this to both endpoints. So this is minus pa plus 2c, pa plus 2c. Just a notation. Um, I also want this to intersect with pi at the single point zero. Again, I can do it if p is large enough because uh, c is O of p. Okay. So I can achieve all of this, no problem. So at this stage, you should assume your primes are further large. So that these are also the case. This is also the case. Um, uh, 
I have intersection. This is one interval. So I shifted this interval by twice the shift. Yes. No, no, all I'm doing is this. So I have, the, uh, sorry. Am I writing something right? Let's look. So here's my zero. Here's my pi, right? Uh, this is minus pa, pa. And then I'm going to shift it a little bit. Um, to, sorry. Oh. Right, right. This is the action spectrum, right? So I want this. This. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So th th that's good. We meant to do this anyway. Um, all right. So now we have our. Uh, I'm going to now write our uh, continuation maps. Um, we are going to have the following uh, commutative diagram. So I want to look at uh, the polar homology in this interval pi for the Hamiltonian h to the p in the class with orbits considered in the class beta to the p. Uh, I am going to have now this mapping to pi plus 2c with the same stuff here, this is the maps uh, given by the quotient inclusion maps. All what's going on here is indeed um, there everything is here. There's nothing in this interval, nothing in this interval. It's just like the Morse case. Look at the Morse homology for a certain interval. If there are no critical values in between, just you can shift it a little bit and you're going to get an isomorphism. Okay, so this is an isomorphism, and these are just, you um, can call it stability of filtered polar homology, whatever you like, basically. The point being, there are no other action uh, values in the remaining thing. Now, this map um, factors uh, through our continuation maps. So I'm going to have here, um, so now I'm looking at this homotopy from HP to the H to the P prime. Um, this, as I said, will induce a shift. This will be one shift here. Homotopy class is the same. And now I want to go back from here to here. This map factors through this uh, just like that. These are continuation maps. So, and th this is my second shift, basically. Now, um, this is an isomorphism. What do I have on this side of the story? So let's look at this group. Uh, this group is, at the beginning, I think I, I wrote this. This will be. Um, generated by some orbits in particular. Uh, again, uh, this is an interval uh, centered at 0, which is the action value for x to the p. So, and x to the p is a homologically non-trivial orbit, because as uh, we have discussed, so I have this. And by assumption, I know this is not 0. So that tells me that this group is non 0. So I've got this isomorphism between two non-zero groups. So the conclusion of the story is that this is non-zero. So this, of course, tells us that there exists a p-prime periodic orbit. of H in the class zeta to the P. Let's give it a name. 
Let's call it y. Now there comes a crucial step. And the crucial step is we still need to show that this orbit is simple. Yes, this is a good thing to erase. Which is, of course, no, not going to be a problem for us with our assumptions. I uh, have, uh, so let's suppose not. The only way this can happen, it's uh, a p prime periodic orbit with p prime being a prime. It has to be a p prime iterated uh, orbit of an underlying one periodic orbit. So then uh, this y is it's something like that for some z. And this z, of course, uh, that must have the homology class given by p divided by p prime, the class of zeta, which is the class of Rx orbit. And, uh, well, simply because we are here, right? It's equal to y, and y is in this homotopy class. So, just like this. Okay, but you see, this is not an integer class. It, uh, these primes are big, so. A P and times P prime. So maybe one has to be a little careful. This doesn't have to be primitive, but uh, and then you write this some integer times a primitive class, etc. All the everything works, of course, if you're uh, exactly the same name. So, so this can't happen. In other words, uh, this gives us a contradiction, and so y has to be simple. Okay. So this is. Um, as I said, this is a crucial step here, showing that this orbit simple. Uh, we, we wouldn't be able to do it, indeed, if we had torsion, if we had, um, uh, or if, yeah, if we ended up in a uh, trivial homotopy class, basically. So, uh, I guess th this makes it much simpler than the Kony conjecture <laughs> proof, where you work with contractible periodic orbits. You really need index contribution to be able to actually show that these orbits are simple. Otherwise, here, uh, non-contractable um, class helps us do that. All right. Are there any questions? That's the end of this proof. And now I want to look briefly to the moral requirement. You have a question. So I want to maybe keep this a little bit, not to repeat it. It may not be small, but nonetheless, it's given by the Hamiltonian. It is some thing. But now, now, but you, you don't have to do this thing, but I mean, some thing is that you can do this, but it, you, don't, you don't really need this condition, right? That you are always true. No, I do. You do? Where? Where? Well, uh, how was I going to, again, erase all of this, but. Uh, how am I going to say, for instance, that these ships and all of this are uh, going to be small compared to the growth of uh, 
Yeah, exactly. This is what it is. If I didn't know. Yeah. Zero is contained there, actually. Yeah, I do exactly, exactly that. And then shift it a little bit. I'm saying a little, uh, it, it is, yeah, relatively little, yeah. Yes, it does, I, yes, it does, it, it comes from that, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. By smaller relatives. <laughs> Exactly. You, otherwise, you could be. Right. Right. But but that's exactly part of the point. I can't do do that because of this shift is, is small. That's okay. No, look. Yeah. Okay. So what happens um, if the moreover part? So let's now look at this case. You can actually remove the finiteness assumption. You can remove the non-trivial homology class assumption, non-zero homology class assumption, and just assume that you are working with a non-contractible uh, periodic orbit. Um, so now, uh, t t you see, there were two, where did we use these assumptions? Now let's take a, another look at the proof. Uh, one place was, of course, that because uh, one place was, of course, that the you know, this implies that you have a non-contractible orbit in particular when you have non-zero homology class, the trivial part. And then uh, it's the fact that uh, these zeta i's that contribute, that show up as periodic orbits in, um, in the homotopy class of orbit, are their large prime that powers are distinct. Okay, so these are, this is the main place, this item number two here, uh, is where we actually used both of these assumptions. Uh, and of course, we also used it in the end to show that our orbit is simple. Okay, so we need uh, exactly the same thing uh, happening here in this case so that I can remove those assumptions. So now here is a claim. So claim is the following thing. So I'm assuming that I have this uh, homotopy class non-trivial, um, then there exists, this is, uh, so there exists a constant, uh, R of zeta, depends on which class we have, uh, such that if I look at the following equation in the free homotopy classes. So this will be zeta to the p equals 
eta to the q in pi 1 tilde m, where eta is another free homotopy class, and uh, p and q are primes greater than uh, this number r zeta. This equation is satisfied uh, only if eta is zeta and q is p. Okay, so once we have something like that, of course it's uh, it's clear that this is going to prove the zeta to the powers large prime power is a distinct, and it will also show us that uh, the orbit has to be simple at the end of the day because it cannot come from any other homotopy class because of that. Um, okay, so how do you prove this? Um, it's not very simplistic geometry. So this is, uh, we learned it from a, a geometry group theory colleague. Uh, so basically, yeah, these are all somehow properties about hyperbolic groups. Uh, so first of all, uh, suffice to prove it for pi 1. So I need to prove something like that. Uh, VP, I will call these elements VP and uh, W to the Q. Um, uh, and then uh, here is, so I'll just write the main steps. If you have a hyperbolic group, um, so apparently every element of infinite order is contained in a so-called virtually cyclic group. Doesn't really matter what it is for us. It means that it has a subgroup of finite index, but um, subgroup actually. And this group is this. Uh, e of z, uh, you're going to take all elements here, which satisfies the following equality for some add. Okay. So observe that z in particular itself will be here. Well, uh, I'm going to be trying to, here I wrote the zeta eta. When I work with the group, I will be trying to prove uh, this thing happening uh, only when the two are equal and these are equal. Um, if uh, there exists a constant above which this equation is uh, satisfied only under these conditions. So, okay, so there is this. Z is in here. Another group theory effect is that if you have virtually cyclic group, which is also torsion free, this is actually cyclic. So now we want to just apply this in our setting. Um, here's another group theory. So our setting is going to be that um, uh, G is pi 1 of M and Z is just a non-trivial homotopy class uh, in pi 1. Okay? So now, what this is going to give us is uh, Z is not 1. Remember that I also assume that G is torsion 3, along with the hyperbolicity. So this means that Z has infinite order. In particular, this group is infinite cyclic. It is B, basically. Okay, so now uh, you are down to solving this equation in Z. So you are asking, 
is there an R of Z? Such that if I have an equation like that, uh, W, such that in other words, this equation is satisfied uh, only when, right, P is Q and Z is W if PQ is greater than R of Z. And the answer is, of course, yes. Just take uh, R of Z to be greater than any prime divisor of Z. All right, so this is what uh, these conditions boil down to. And as a result, we can uh, remove these uh, two conditions and replace it by simply that this group is hyperbolic and torsion free. So now I want to um, talk a little bit about what happens uh, in the case of toroidally monotone manifolds. OK, so we have enough time to give you the general uh, sort of modifications and the ideas of the proofs. So as I said, uh, similar uh, theorems hold in the toroidally monotone case. First of all, let's look at what these are. Um, before I even state the theorem. Uh, so a class, a homology class, um, a cohomology class, remember, is called a toroidal. If you integrate over all toroidal uh, classes in H2 and get zero. So now what uh, I say is that this is toroidally monotone. By the way, when I say toroidally monotone, I mean monotone or negative monotone. Here it doesn't have to be positive. Uh, so if, as I will write in a second, uh, if um, this class um, lambda C1 PM is a toroidal for some constant lambda. If it is zero, I mean the toroidal case, the previous theory, previous case. Uh, it can be positive, it can be negative, basically. All right. Uh, just like in the usual case, we have a toroidal uh, minimal char number. Uh, in this case, we have a toroidal monotonicity constant, which is this constant in this case, um, etc. So. Example, of course, is what is of interest <laughs> here. Um, the examples, there are plenty of them. In fact, uh, many look at products here. Uh, M1, M2, maybe uh, let's write it this way. So the simplistic form will be the sum. Let's look at this. So, on the left hand side, I want to take something syntactically toroidal. Meaning that both uh, C1 and omega is uh, vanish on the tori, tori on toroidal classes. So C1, I'll write it this way for sure. Let's write it this way. Okay? So, of course, examples. Uh, Surfaces of hydrogenous, uh, closed scalar manifolds of numeric curvature. Uh, <coughs> On this side, you can take any spherically monotone uh, or negative monotone. going to be um, complete intersections, uh, M2 equals to a complete intersection. Again, Victor talked about this in his second lecture, I believe. So what happens then is the product becomes steroidally monotone. And um, in these ca cases, uh, 
so if you take, for example, um, the negatively curved Kähler and the complete intersection. Uh, Yeah, or negative monotone. Do we assume pi one trivial? Well, in the well, in the uh, complete intersections are simply connected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, may not be. I think I thought it is, but so the question is if the second one is not toroidally monotone. Toroidally monotone. <laughs> simply connected case. Yeah, 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 yeah. Simply connected case. Yeah, yeah. Simply connected case. Yeah. Pi one zero. You're right. And then you will also have uh, hyperbolic, hyperbolic pi one uh, for the product, which is and torsion three, which is nice. So now uh, let me tell you the theorems. So uh, let's write this as theorem two. Although this is actually theorem three, but. Um, Again, these are our, from our paper with Victor. So basically, theorem one holds um, So first of all, what's happening here? Maybe it's worth saying. So uh, we no longer are going to have a nice, uh, well-defined action in this case. So I am not going into details of the Fleur theory. Of course, Fleur theory will need to be modified uh, in this case. But we no longer are going to have uh, a well-defined action. And this is going to come with several uh, complications. And so we actually need to assume something else uh, in, the, in the theorems. The regular action filtration will be replaced by another action filtration, which, is, which I am going to discuss next. So this is the setup. Um, so basically, the short version I'm not to repeat, given that theorem 1 is done. So I'm going to say that theorem one holds if we uh, have an additional topological uh, condition, and this is that uh, the following Euler characteristic, I write it this way, is non-zero. Um, so for some, uh, maybe. For some, for some interval, I uh, with endpoints outside the action spectrum, um, now I'm going to put the tilde here because this is no longer the regular action spectrum. So. Again, this is our next discussion, but let me tell you nonetheless what this is. The regular action is going to be replaced by the augmented action, which is defined by, um, I take the regular action minus lambda 2, the mean index of the orbit. Now, notice the following thing. Normally, I would need to have a capping here, of course. I don't in this case. Because this is the way it's defined now, this is kept independent. Okay. So, under some favorable circumstances, this 
actually can be used as a filtration. Uh, so we can define a augmented section filter to our homology. And uh, not always, it doesn't work as nice. That's why we need uh, additional condition over there. But this tilde comes from um, that basically. So these are the H tilde X is where X is um, Augmented friction spectrum, so to speak. Okay, so what is this? Uh, this is um, Euler characteristic. So you're looking at the regular topological index, sum of uh, indices of periodic orbits, one periodic orbits, uh, in the somatopy class, falling in the small interval. Okay, so the fact that you don't have, the fact that you have this is non-zero, ensures that. Uh, corresponding flare homology group is non-zero. You may remember we had our commutative diagram. There were two important pieces, the middle isomorphism, and there was the first group non-zero. So this, as I said, this doesn't work as nicely as the action. So it doesn't give us a strict filtration. Because of this, we need to pay a price in etching something else to get the non-zero when non-vanishing of the flare homology. OK. so. Otherwise, everything works the same way. So this, this is what we will look into shortly. Um, another thing, maybe it makes us also think. Um, so this is some of uh, index of um, I guess return maps of one periodic orbit in with A H tilde in I. For those of you who are taking notes, and in this class, basically. So let's see this this for now. Yeah. What is lambda? Lambda is. Uh, from that definition. So uh, omega uh, and uh, C1 are proportional, and that's this is the toroidal monotone sit concept. This is the, that lambda, and this is exactly what makes it capping independent. So contributions from adding uh, cappings are canceled. So here's another theorem. And this is the hyperbolic case. Here we have another, uh, again, the manifold is a toro. Toroidally monotone. So here the assumption is this. So we have toroidal first churn, uh, toroidal minimal churn, greater than or equal to n half plus one, uh, technical but essential in the proof uh, condition here. And again, we assume that uh, phi has uh, a periodic orbit a one periodic hyperbolic very important in fact this orbit x with um, basically I need to assume all these guys are decreasing. Again, this will be satisfied if uh, if you have homology class of the orbit non-zero, etc. So, uh, assertion is that the same phi h. No, assertion is slightly different actually. Has infinitely many simple periodic orbits in these homotopy classes. So you can think of something like a, again, a surface of higher genus and a, and a projective, uh, complex projective space, something like that, which will satisfy the conditions here. Okay, so now um, 
Let me say one thing. This is something I don't think I'm going to get time to come back to about the proof of theorem three. Again, there, there is this one part of sorry, one part of our diagram was this group. Um, so there was p i in this case. I'm going to put a k i i here. I'm going to put. So this is about the proof of theorem. And then I'm going to have this. So, what's going on here is that you're going to need to know that this is non zero for some sequence of Ki's. Just like, you know, when you bring the proof in a situation where you have your commutative diagram, this is what you will need to know. And in this case, this um, ingredient that's going to help you prove this is going to be, uh, is going to come from the following. Uh, Thing. So again, I maybe Victor will discuss this, maybe will not. Um, in, a, in a different uh, paper, we proved the following thing. Um, we called it the ball crossing energy theorem, which says the following thing. If you want to enter or exit in the neighborhood of a hyperbolic orbit, you need to have um, the energy required to do this is bounded from below by a constant, which is independent of iteration. This is absolutely crucial here is that this orbit is hyperbolic. So you use this uh, to prove uh, this theorem. So basically, you bring it to a point where you show that this uh, iterations, x to the k iterations of this are hyperbolic orbit, uh, cannot be connected, uh, cannot be connected to a periodic orbit, which is sufficiently nearby, of index of relative index plus minus one. So basically, you are showing that this is a close but not exact uh, in the complex. Okay, so this tells you that this is non zero. So the flavor of the proof is actually quite different than uh, this one. Right? So this is, this is what happens here. Um, so now, so let's look at uh, the action. See for. As I promised, I said that we can filter our, uh, we can define augmented action filter flow homology under favorable instances. And this is definitely what happens in our, uh, in the proof of our theorem. So, okay, so augmented action filtration. Let's a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, uh, so here is the definition. Uh, I'm just repeating what I wrote. This will be one con for a one periodic orbit from this class. Let's say H or PH from zeta. Um, this is the standard action minus lambda half, where lambda is the toroidal monotonicity constant times the mean index of the orbit, keeping independent. some things. Uh, this, of course, has the same uh, homogeneity property because this is homogeneous and the mean index is homogeneous, again, as Victor told us. Uh, and uh, this becomes a filtration uh, under suitable conditions for the flare complex. So let's set um, so maybe here. something I already defined. So this is our augmented action uh, values. This is the augmented action spectrum. Now, this set is still closed, but it is a no longer zero measure set. This set now contain, can contain whole intervals, basically. So it's not, it's definitely nowhere as nice as the standard action spectrum, which is zero measure. So.
So let's define uh, now the following thing. So I'm going to define the gap of a Hamiltonian. So this will be the minimal spectral gap. So I'll maybe drop the, from the notation uh, zeta, but zeta is in the picture here uh, because it is in here. Uh, so this is the zeta minimum action gap. The infimum of s minus s primes uh, is something from zero to infinity, where s s prime are from this augmented protection spectrum. Okay, so it's defined regardless of uh, whether or not h is non-degenerate. One important thing is that this is not the lower semi-continuous or upper semi-continuous function. So further, let's set C0 to be absolute value of lambda, 2m plus minus 1 divided by 2, where plus minus 1, remember lambda can be positive, negative, so this is going to be the sign of lambda. If it's positive, it's 2m plus 1, for example. Um, notice that it is equal to 0 when uh, in the heteroidal case, basically. Okay, so, and then we say, I should start bringing the boards down. Okay. What we call the gap condition. So, the gap condition we say is satisfied if this gap is greater than C0 of n. So the goal is that uh, there will be a filter fuller homology uh, using this thing, uh, provided that this condition holds. Okay. So fuller homology is filtered. By augmented action, spect uh, augmented action if, uh, let's call it GC, GC holds. So to this end, you do the following thing. First, let's write one proposition here. So let's suppose that everything is, uh, so one period of the corpus are non-degenerate to begin with, and that the gap condition holds for H. Then you show that uh, the complex, therefore, the homology is filtered by this uh, action in this non-degenerate condition. So, let's say if you are complex and, uh, and the gap is filtered by H. What this means is that, so you know what this means, if I have a connecting orbit, say, from x to y, like that, um, then the augmented action for y is uh, less or equal to the augmented action of x. So there exists a connecting trajectory. Um, again, I would like to emphasize the Nusel's equality here, which is, of course, a strict inequality in the regular, for the regular action. And this, the fact that we don't have uh, strict inequality, of course, causes uh, lots of complications. But anyway, this is what we have. So it can happen that uh, these two can be equal. Easily. So the proof of this is actually easy. Maybe I am going to actually do it because there is a part that is uh, nice and useful. 
So I want to, so let's just assume it, it really doesn't matter whether lambda is positive or negative. So they all are done the same way. So let's suppose that uh, for simplicity, uh, it is positive, can be negative. Uh, fix the capping. And uh, when I fix the capping of x under this condition that there is a um, connecting orbit, this is going to give me a capping for y. So this gives us a uh, capping um, inherited from x, so uh, from y. So then we have the following thing. Let's write using some of the things Victor told us today. OK, so let's start writing. So I have augmented protection for y. Uh, now, here I don't need capping, but here, actually, I'm going to write it. Now, first of all, standard polar differential decreases the standard action. So I can replace this by action um, x bar. And for the mean index part, uh, again, uh, today Victor told us that and explained to us that the difference between uh, the mean index and the Colmstander index can be at most half the dimension. So let's just use that here. I am in the non-degenerate case, so common index is defined. So I can do this. And now using the fact that the index difference between two orbits is one, the common indices, there is a connecting trajectory. So I'm going to further write this. And now I have x bar. I'm going to again use this inequality, this time to turn it back to the mean index. I will have another n introduced here. And finally, I have, I can now recollect back my augmented action. This will be the augmented action for x plus some uh, constant depending on, uh, which is exactly the C0 uh, when lambda is not negative. Okay. So what this tells us is that AH tilde y, the beginning and the end, is less than the augmented protection of x in this picture plus this uh, constant depending on your manifold, basically. Okay, so this, this is kind of, a, this is important. So it's, it tells us that this differential uh, does not increase the augmented protection more than C0 of m, basically. Uh, so at least we have like a good, at least we have a control of the situation. Again, I would like uh, you to note that, <laughs> I mean, this is easy, but uh, what this boils down to in the standard case when this is zero is just this is, you know, as you expect, a action. And this becomes the standard action, so the action of y is less than action of x, uh, basically. So now if the gap condition holds, uh, in addition to this, so this means that the gap uh, of this function is greater than the quantity, then of course we are going to get this. Okay. So this is the proof of the fact that we have this in the non-degenerate case. So now once this 
is in mind, uh, of course, we want to do field to two arteries. Is usually you do first uh, the non-degenerate case. You can go ahead and do it for non-degenerate uh, Hamiltonian. So you're going to have uh, filtration and uh, homology, filter to our homology will be defined. And uh, so let's put the tilde here to indicate that this is filtered by different uh, action filtration. So I have an object like that. Um, again, this is an interval outside the action spectrum, augmented action spectrum. Uh, so this is defined. All right, now, uh, so far H is non-degenerate. There is one more step here. You want to do the um, degenerate case, of course, to be able to talk about this. Now, uh, you see, of course, what you want to do is you want to perturb, which is what we do. However, uh, this gap function, as I said, is not uh, lower semi-continuous. So we cannot quite just say that if you take any Hamiltonian for which gap condition holds, I cannot just say that when I perturb it, gap condition still holds, basically. Okay, so there is a little proof there. So, which I am probably not going to do. I'm not going to do here, but nonetheless, I just wanted you to notice that these objects are not as nice. So, this, uh, you have to do a little proof. So, any Hamiltonian now, not necessarily as non degenerate, okay. and that gap holds for this one. Again, this was independent of the non-degeneracy. And uh, so, okay, to be very precise, let's pick a, a value which is not in the augmented action spectrum. So the claim is that for every non-degenerate perturbation, um, the Hamiltonian, let's call it K, sufficiently C1 close to uh, H, uh, the, the subspace CF tilde given by minus infinity A K, CF tilde K is a subspace. Okay. So this is what you need to prove. Again, as I said, because gap is gap function is not lower semi-continuous. It's not automatic from proposition one. What's important in this proof, again, it's not, it's not a bit difficult, uh, is actually this, uh, which, again, I have never used the fact that the, um, th this actually holds, uh, uh, as far as I remember, yeah, this is what gets into the proof. It's, I meant subcomplex. This is a thing. Of course, I need this to be subcomplex. Okay, so now um, the rest is now that we have, once we do prop two, and we're going to be, uh, we can define this, we can really now define this, basically. And now go back to our uh, commutative diagram. Replace um, all the uh, so fluor uh, homology groups with the tilde fluor homology groups. Everything works the same. Again, there are proofs, of course, like how does the continuation work, etc. But so you're going to have this. Um, again, ah, I should say, now what is the shift here? There was a shift, if you remember. Uh, so let me write what the shift is in this case. We will have this factoring through the following group. Again, P prime with zeta is the same. Uh, this will be an isomorphism. The fact that this is not non-zero now in the case of toroidally 
uh, in the first term, in the second term, I'm sorry, the consequence of the Euler characteristic non-vanishing. And in the hyperbolic case, it's what I explained. Now, what is the shift here? Now, our action is slightly different. Now, there's, it's got the standard part and there's the mean index part. So now the shift is going to be the following thing. So C now will be the, it's going to have the standard Hopper norm times the P prime, P minus P prime piece, maybe actually this. And then it's going to have, so this will be the maximum action shift. And then you will have a maximum mean index shift. And the mean index shift is going to be um, uh, norm of absolute value of lambda, and then you will have an n bar. Okay? Uh, I emphasize that no matter what, this is still <laughs> uh, something order of p, and uh, therefore all these arguments actually go through nicely in this case as well. So, um, I think I, I think I am done. Thank you.